Welcome back to Special Relativity. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the space-time interval. And later on in this video, we're going to use the space-time interval to talk about causality. But before we begin, let's forget momentarily about special relativity and go back to regular coordinate system mathematics. Say I have a coordinate system with the spatial coordinates x and y, so your regular Cartesian plane. And suppose now that I have a stick in this coordinate system that is L units long, with its tip right over here at x s comma y s, and its base at the origin. You can write the length of the stick L in terms of the coordinates x s and y s using the Pythagorean theorem as follows. Now if I apply a coordinate transformation where I perform a rotation of the x y axes to the x prime y prime axes, the tip of my stick will move to x s prime comma y s prime in this new coordinate system. However, the length of my stick shouldn't change even in these new coordinates. So therefore, even if the x s prime and y s prime are different from the original x s and y s, their sum of squares is still preserved even under this rotation. And that makes sense, just a simple coordinate transformation should not change the length of your stick. So then, in that case, we can say that this length of the stick, this quantity that is preserved under the rotation, the sum of squares, is invariant. That is, it does not vary under the coordinate transformation of a simple rotation. Now in special relativity, when we transform coordinates of space and time between different inertial reference frames, we don't use a simple rotation, we use the Lorentz transformation. Now the question becomes, just like how there was an invariant quantity given by the sum of squares under a simple rotation transformation in our regular two-dimensional coordinate system, is there an equivalent invariant quantity for a Lorentz transformation? And the answer, of course, is yes. To show what I mean by this, let's go to our Lorentz transformation equations again. But we'll start from the basics. Suppose I have two reference frames, r and r prime, which I'll draw using this set of axes. The r prime reference frame is moving at a velocity of v in the positive x direction relative to the reference frame r. The coordinates of some random event according to the reference frame r are given by x, y, z, and t, while the coordinates of that same event according to r prime are given by these primed coordinates. Now suppose that my reference frames both line up exactly with overlapping coordinate systems and all that. Suppose my reference frames r and r prime line up at time zero, both in the unprimed and the primed frame of reference. And when this happens, when these reference frames align with synchronized clocks, suppose that I have a light bulb that turns on at time zero, with the spatial coordinate of zero as well, relative to both reference frames. I will call this event the event of the light bulb turning on. I will call this event A, with the coordinates x, a, y, a, z, a, and t, a, according to the unprimed reference frame r, and x prime a, y prime a, z prime a, and t prime a, according to the primed reference r prime. Of course, these coordinates are all zero because the light bulb turns on at time zero at the origin when both frames are lined up. Next, suppose that at some time t b prime, according to the reference frame r prime, my light bulb reaches the coordinates x b prime, y b prime, and z b prime. Once it's here at the time t b prime, then the bulb turns off, and I'll call this turning off event event b. The space-time coordinates of event b according to the reference frame r prime are given, of course, by these primed coordinates with the subscript b. Meanwhile, the space-time coordinates of b according to the reference frame r are given by these unprimed coordinates. Now, how do I convert from the primed coordinates of event b to the unprimed coordinates? Well, I use the Lorentz transformation equation, specifically the inverse transformation equations. Of course, my y and z coordinates don't change because the reference frames are only going in the x direction relative to each other. There's no motion in the y or z directions. The next thing I'll do is I'll define the change in coordinates from event A to event B. So in the reference frame R, the change in the x coordinate between the events A and B is given by delta x, and in the reference frame R prime, the change in coordinates becomes delta x prime. I can use the same logic for the y, z, and t coordinates as well. If we substitute now the inverse Lorentz transformed coordinates, and if we also remember the fact that the coordinates of event A, both in the primed and the unprimed reference frames are zero, then this is what we get after simplifying. 
Let's now consider a quantity given by the following, the negative c delta t squared plus the sum of squares of the changes in the spatial coordinates. I'll call this quantity s squared. Of course, this quantity is relative to the reference frame r. The corresponding quantity s prime squared according to the prime reference frame r prime would then be given by the following. I can plug in the values of the delta prime squared coordinates to get the following more simplified expression for s prime squared, and this I'm going to call equation one. Now, let's look at the s squared term. We'll substitute the coordinate changes into our unprimed s squared equation to get this. Recall that my gamma, the Lorentz factor, is given by the following equation, where v is again the velocity of the r prime reference frame relative to r. Gamma squared can then be written as c squared over the difference between c squared and v squared. If I now plug this into my s squared equation, this is what I'll get. I'll now expand out the squared terms in the parentheses to end up with this much longer equation. Next I'm going to multiply out the c squared in the first term, and then I'm going to take the c squared over c squared minus v squared term common from the first two expressions to end up with this equation. I can cancel these two terms over here with the v and the xb prime and combine the terms involving the tb prime squared and the xb prime squared to get the following. And finally, if I distribute this initial factor over the brackets and simplify, I end up with the following equation for s squared in the reference frame r, and I'm going to call this equation 2. You'll notice that the s squared equation in equation 2 and the s prime squared equation in equation 1 are exactly the same. Even after my Lorentz transformation, the value of s squared didn't change. It was the same in the unprimed coordinates as it was in the prime coordinates. And since the value of s squared didn't change under a Lorentz transformation, it is invariant, meaning it does not vary, under a Lorentz transformation. Just like how distance or the length of the stick was invariant in my simple rotation example at the start of the video. In fact, this s squared has a special name. It's known as the space-time interval. It denotes the separation between two events in space-time. The space-time interval between two events stays the same regardless of what inertial reference frame I'm using to view those two events. The individual components in the space-time interval equation, like the delta x squared for instance, might change between Lorentz transformations, but the overall space-time interval, the overall s squared, will not change. And because the space-time interval doesn't change between Lorentz transformation, the only thing it depends on is the events themselves, and not on the coordinate transformation or the reference frame. And because of this, because my s squared depends only on the events themselves and not on the reference frame or coordinates, I can use s squared to tell me the nature of those two events. And this leads me to the idea of causality. To illustrate this idea, let's begin by drawing a space-time diagram with one spatial dimension. Of course, in this space-time diagram, my time is measured in light meters, so the world line of light, or the light line, will be at a 45 degree angle relative to the time axis and to the x-axis. We've talked about why this would be the case in my previous videos on space-time diagrams, so review those if you haven't already. Suppose now that I have two events A and B, with A being situated on the origin and B being situated inside the light cone formed by this light line and its companion light lines. Suppose also that I have an event C, such that C pretty much falls on the light line like so. And finally, suppose that I have an event D that is outside the light line. Now recall that my space-time interval S squared is given by the following equation. Now in this particular scenario, because I'm only considering one spatial dimension, the x, and because my speed of light is 1 in these units, because time is measured in light meters, my space-time interval simply becomes negative delta t squared plus delta x squared. Let's now look at the space-time interval between all these events. We'll start with events a and b. You can see in my graph that the vertical separation between A and B, so the time separation, is greater than the horizontal separation between A and B, so the distance separation. As a result, we can conclude that delta T squared is greater than delta X squared between A and B. This means that the space-time interval between A and B is negative because the delta T term overpowers the delta X term in my S squared equation. 
And when the space-time interval between two events is negative, those events are said to be time-like separated because the time separation dominates over the spatial separation. So the events are time-like separated. So A and B here are time-like separated events. Let's now look at events A and C. You can see in my graph that the vertical separation between A and C, so the time separation, is equal to the horizontal separation between A and C, so the distance separation. As a result, delta t squared and delta x squared are equal between A and C, meaning that the space-time interval between A and C is zero. And when the space-time interval between two events is zero, those events are said to be light-like separated because the line between those two events on the space-time diagram is parallel to the light line, hence light-like separation. The other name for this is null separated because in this case the space-time interval is zero between those two events or null. So A and C here are light-like or null separated events. And finally, let's look at events A and D. You can see that the vertical separation between A and D, the time separation, is less compared to the horizontal separation between A and D, so the distance separation. As a result, delta t squared is less than the delta x squared between A and D, so the space-time interval between A and D is now positive. And when the space-time interval between two events is positive, those events are said to be space-like separated because the spatial separation dominates over the time separation, so the events are space-like separated. A and D here are therefore space-like separated events. The important thing to keep in mind about space-like separated events is that they cannot be causal. Let me give you an example by drawing a new space-time diagram, again with a light line in the middle for reference. Suppose I have an event A, which I will arbitrarily place on the origin, and a space-like separated event D right over here at x equals 5 meters and t equals 4 light meters. The space-time interval between A and D is the difference between delta t squared and delta x squared, which in this case is negative 16 plus 25 or positive 9. Now because my space-time interval is positive, I could theoretically create an inertial reference frame in which I would measure the delta t between a and d to be zero. And that's allowed because even though s squared is invariant, it's the same between different inertial reference frames, the individual components delta t and delta x can still change. So it's theoretically possible to have an inertial reference frame where the delta t component between the space-like separated events a and d is zero. And what happens when the time separation between A and D becomes zero? Well, those events become simultaneous according to that particular frame of reference. And clearly, if two events can become simultaneous in one particular inertial reference frame, one event could not have caused the other, and that's why two space-like separated events cannot be causal. This isn't really an issue for time-like separated events. Why? Well, take an event B inside this light line at 4,5. The space-time interval between A and B is negative. In fact, it's negative 9 here. Now, no matter what Lorentz transformation I do, the S squared between A and B will always remain negative 9. This means that it is straight up not possible for me to have an inertial reference frame where the delta T observed between A and B becomes 0. That's because if it did become 0, my S squared would become positive and not remain negative 9. But since S squared is invariant, it must remain negative 9 no matter what Lorentz transformation I do, no matter what inertial reference frame I'm viewing things through. And because I cannot construct a reference frame where two time-like separated events become simultaneous, it is then possible for those time-like separated events to be causal. Anyway, that should do it for this video on space-time intervals and causality. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.